Hello, this is Real History with Melissa, and it is Thursday, the 16th of March, 2023. And I had someone lined up, I'll just leave that as a surprise, but unfortunately, something came up and they were not able to record with me. So, one of the things that I learned from Alan was consistency. If you say that you're putting something up on Thursday, then you always put it up on Thursday. So I was thinking, well, I could just prattle on by myself, or I could call Aunt Betty. So I decided to call Aunt Betty. And she said, because she always just tells it like it is, nobody wants to hear about the childhood of a 93-year-old woman. (laughs) And I said, well, you're wrong. They do. And I don't care if they want to hear. That's what they're getting. So thank you, Aunt Betty, for letting me pick you up this morning and bring you over to record with me. Hello. Hello. Well, what I wanted to talk about was a couple of things. Um, I was thinking about your early childhood. You were born in 1929, and that was the stock market crash. Mm -hmm. And then sadly, your father died in 1933 when you were four years old. And that was right during the Depression. So I was thinking about everything that was going on in the country at that time and money and the fact that your mother was a youngish woman with six children. And they ranged in age. Tell us how old they they were. Dad, my dad was the youngest, and he was only a few months old. Is that right? Mm-hmm. That's right. And the oldest one, Clarice... She was fourteen, and he wa- and uh, Johnny, the youngest one, was three months old. What I started to look into last night was were the the value of the dollar and what things cost, and and so I started thinking that that might be interesting for people to hear a little bit about that. But then when we were talking, you said, "Well." Tell us what happened with Mima's finances after your dad died. What was going on? Well, she she didn't have any money because he was the <laughs> he made good money when he had his um, he had a service station and he was also a mechanic. He worked on cars and he was building a trailer for the agriculture department of the high school when he um, got killed. He um, he was working on building a trailer for them. She got the money for that, and then after that, she didn't have any money to live on, and she didn't know what she was going to do. But she got... She finally got some insurance, and she lived on $50 a month. That's what she got. Now, that was her guaranteed income mm-hmm. for the insurance. Do you know how long that lasted, if it, it was a few years or a long time? It or? lasted until Johnny was 18 years old. Okay. Now... Some of the things that I was looking into last night was what was a dollar worth then? So $50 a month was $600 a year. So that was, if, if that's all she had to live on, that was $600 a year. And one of the things that I found out was they said that most people made between what thirteen hundred and fifty dollars a month and fifteen hundred dollars a month. So let's say the average is, I don't know, fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars a month. So she was making less 
than half of the average mm-hmm. on the life insurance. Mm-hmm. But you said that that she also took some part-time jobs. Why don't you talk about that just a little bit? Oh, she tried to sell cars, and uh, (laughs) that was back in 1934, 33. And uh, she got a a job uh, selling cars at a dealership, and then um, she sold Avon products. And then she got a job working at the high school cafeteria as a a cook or a helper. Mm -hmm. Well, so to put things in context, if the average was the, you know, less than 1,500 a, a year for an income, then some of the people that were making more money than that, considerably more money, it's interesting, had to do with travel and transportation. So I would imagine that when your father was alive with a a service station and being a mechanic, he was doing pretty well Mm -hmm. indeed Mm -hmm. because uh, the number one, or at least the number one that I could find, um, income, was airline pilots. And back in 1933, airline pilots were making $8,000 a year. So they were making, you know, pretty much four times the, the, the average. And then the next was the um, railroad executives were making about 4000 a year. Mm-hmm. But a railroad, um, what do you call the guys? Sorry, the word just went out of my head. The conductor. Engineer. Yeah, the engineer. Yeah. Engineer. The engineers were um, making; they, they could be making twenty five hundred or three thousand. But you know, the, the people who dealt in cars and mechanics were doing really well. So they would have been making probably more than two thousand a year. And we owned our we owned our home, three bedroom home, and uh, he, he owned the the service station, which was out on the highway in front of our home, sort of to the side, you know, Mm -hmm. of our home, out in the, it was on close to the road, the service station. He owned that. And so after he passed away, she rented it to a, a man. She rented the service station out, and he never paid her a penny. And he stole all of the tools. Oh. <laughs> he stole all my daddy's tools. <laughs> oh. And she thought she was doing, you know, a good thing to rent it out, and she never got any rent out of it. And finally, she made him move and uh, had to get the law to get him out of there. Mm. Oh, that's terrible. Mm-hmm. Well, that, since you're talking about home ownership, um, I'll just put these out. We'll come back to these numbers again. But the average home price in 1933 was $6,000. And the average cost of a brand new car was $500. Mm-hmm. So those were those, the, the values at that time. So, but the way that you described your childhood was that whatever Mima was doing to supplement that life insurance money, mm-hmm. she was doing okay. She was managing because you said that you never felt that you were poor mm-hmm. and that you were actually able to help your neighbors during the Depression. So I wanted you to tell people about life at home and the things that you ate in the garden and all of that? Well, we always had a garden. She always planted a garden. And uh, we also had two cows, uh, Blackie and Susie, (laughs) and they gave a lot of milk. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a pasture next door to where we lived, several acres, and uh, she uh, always took the cows to eat in that pasture. 
And then she supplemented their food with uh, cow feed. Mm -hmm. She bought cow feed for them. But we always had a lot of milk and butter. And um, we had a... Where did the butter come from? The the milk. So, in other words, you churned it. Uh Uh-huh. We churned on the back porch. We'd sit in a chair or stand up and churn and make butter. (laughs) And um, we always had buttermilk and sweet milk and butter. Mm -hmm. And we had chickens. We had plenty of eggs. We had fruit trees. We had uh, pear trees that had delicious pears. They were really big Mm -hmm. pears, and they were good. I remember eating pears. When I'd come home from school, I'd go pick me a pear and sit in the <laughs> porch swing on the front porch and eat my pear. <laughs> ah, and figs. Yeah, we had two fig trees, and we had so many figs. Um, Mother would make fig preserves, and they were delicious with hot biscuits. Mm. And then we would give them away or sell them by the gallon sell those figs sell the figs by the gallon or the preserves you said that she'd make preserves and sell them to where did she sell them oh we didn't sell the preserve we ate them (laughs) (laughs) what kinds of things did me mom have in the garden this is by the way east texas so it's um a little wetter greener nicer climate than north texas where we are now It's probably a much better growing climate, I would think, richer soil and so forth. But well, the first vegetable that would ripen was was the radishes. I remember the radishes, and then we had lettuce, we had um, peas, English peas we called them, green peas. And we had um, pole beans, and they were delicious, too. Is pole bean, is that what people call green beans, or uh-huh. is that... A- green beans. And potatoes, we would have new potatoes, we called them. They were little red potatoes, and they were so good. And... Um, Corn. Mm. We also had corn in the garden. And um, purple hull peas. Ooh, I love purple (laughs) hull peas. (laughs) They were so good, but they stained your fingers purple when you you, um, shell the peas. You would have a purple stain on your fingers. But we always had an ice box. And the ice man would come every other day and put a 50-pound block of ice in that ice box. And it kept the butter and the milk and vegetables or whatever she had in there. Mm -hmm. Now, you also talked about the meat So, now, I just heard this little factoid um, from one of my brothers because I was was talking to a man on last week's episode by the name of Neil Foster, and he lives in Florida, and he's a gardener now, and also he's building a chicken coop. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know anything at all about raising chickens, but one of my brothers was, I won't say who, but (laughs) he was telling me that he had heard that the average um, hen only lays for about 18 months, maybe a year and a half, so they always have to be replenished with new laying hens. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? I don't remember that, but I know we had chicken, we had a lot of fried chicken. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's your answer. (laughs) So um, you also had other meat, and this is during the Depression, too. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned when I talked to you into doing this with me yesterday, you mentioned round steak would be a a kind of a 
a regular thing. And I looked up the round stick. I wonder if I wrote, I don't think I wrote down that, but it would have it would have been what would have been the equivalent of about five and a half dollars a pound. So it wasn't the. I mean that that's in today's prices. In today's price. So it was a pretty inexpensive cut Me, of meat. Uh-huh. Um, prob- maybe possibly one of the cheapest cuts. But you talked about the way Mima made that, and it was she. Um, she would uh, take the round steak and lay it out and pound it, beat mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. with a, a beater, like a ma- like a hammer, like a little you know, mallet, like a, yeah. and um, then she would. Uh, Season it, salt and pepper, and put flour on it and fry it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we had with gravy. That's what down here in the in the south of the U.S. we call chicken fried, Mm -hmm. and every everything gets chicken fried. Chicken fried steak and and gravy, and then she would make um, mashed potatoes, and sometimes she made delicious twice baked potatoes. Mm. And they were covered with cheese. You, you bake them twice, and you make them like um, like uh, mashed potatoes. But then you put them back in the shell, the potato shell, and then you put cheese on them and put them back in the oven. So that's why they call them twice baked potatoes, and they're very good. And she would make macaroni and cheese, and we loved macaroni and cheese (laughs) made from scratch. They didn't have boxed macaroni and cheese (laughs) back then. But we always had a lot, you know, plenty of food to eat, rice and gravy and fried chicken, baked chicken. And you said that the cows produce so much milk that mm-hmm. she would share it. She would just share that, give it to the neighbors there. Yeah, she did. She gave a lot of milk away that we couldn't use. We all drank a lot of milk and uh, used it on our oatmeal every morning and, and drank a glass of milk. And I don't know if... Um, Other people will understand the kind of family joke, but remember um, that my dad loved to drink milk. Remember that story that you... Uh Can you tell that? Um, Johnny, her dad, he would always drink his glass of milk, just turn it up and and not put it down until it was all gone. (laughs) And then he would put his glass down and he'd say, want more milk? (laughs) And so Billy told him, he said, um, he, well, Billy, he, um, was two years older than, no, he was 18 months older than John. Mm -hmm. And he would always put a lot of sugar on his oatmeal or his cereal. And Johnny told him, he said, Billy Mac, if you don't stop putting so much sugar on your, Oatmeal, you're going to have sugar diabetes. <laughs> That's what they called it, was sugar diabetes. And Billy said, yes, that's right. And if you don't quit drinking so much milk, you're going to have milk of magnesia. <laughs> they were just little little bitty kids, you know, little tiny Boys, I don't know how they knew those words, but they did. <laughs> and you were the big sister of them, uh-huh. so you were kind of right in the middle. It, you had, and then you had all these much older brothers and sisters. Had two, and, two older brothers, and, much older. Well, that is funny. That makes me laugh. Um, well, I, I just before we get off the, the money. I wanted to tell you about some of the stuff that I researched, and I took the calculator out because we're talking about a car. Let's start. They said a Plymouth car was four hundred and forty-five dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, I rounded it up to five hundred because they said that was the average car. Well, first of all, let me back up. Do you have any idea what a dollar? 
in 1933 would be worth in dollars in 2023. So that's 90 years ago. I, I have no idea. Okay. I know we did have a car. We had a car when my daddy died, and my mother kept it. Mm -hmm. Well, a dollar in 1933 is $22.66. <laughs> and it and $22. that's right so but the interesting thing about the value of the dollar and what is that the things that you know the dollar's worth goes down in relation to the things that you can buy with it now there that holds true that what I learned is that a car for $500 would be the equivalent. So if you took a dollar mm -hmm. and now it's $22.66. So that means that a $500 car today in today's money would be $11,328.13. Mm -hmm. But Come on, Betty. Can you get a car for 11000 okay. No, not a new car. No. So I researched and found out that the average price of a brand new car this year, right now, is 43000 mm -hmm. So things don't hold steady in that way. You know, the value, what you can get. You could get a car in 1933 for $500. Mm -hmm. That's 11000 Four times that much it costs to get a brand new car today. Same thing for a house. A house in 1933 would cost you $6,000. In today's money, now this is a hard thing to wrap around our head, but the average, so the average price of a home, 1933, $6,000. In today's money, 135000 Nine hundred and thirty-seven fifty-six cents. See that? Mm -hmm. Well, you might say because you get so accustomed to thinking about and you know the value of the dollar and what you can get for your dollar. Well, one hundred and thirty-five thousand nine hundred and thirty-seven dollars is not that much for a brand new house, right? You can't do that mm -hmm. because the average price in the U.S. for a house is. Four hundred and twenty-eight thousand seven hundred. Isn't that remarkable? Mm -hmm. It is. A long time ago, a million years BC, the best things in life were absolutely free. But no one appreciated the sky that was always blue And no one congratulated a moon that was always new So it was planned that they would vanish now and then And you must pay before you get them back again that's what storms were made for And you shouldn't be afraid for Every time it rains, it rains And it's from heaven Don't you know each cloud contains And it's from heaven You'll find your fortune fallen all over town. Be sure that your umbrella is upside down. Trade them for a package of sunshine and flowers. If you want the things you love, you must...
must have showered. So when you hear it thunder, don't run under a tree. There'll be pennies from heaven for you and me. You must have showered. So when you hear it thunder, don't run under a tree. There'll be pennies from heaven for you. So, what I figured out, now we're not talking about compound interest because you understand compound interest and how long it takes to pay off a loan with that, right? Right, that's right. Well, just let's just say for a moment that you could buy something without paying interest on it. Ha, ha, ha. So that means that that home, if the average income in 1933 was $1,500, then you could buy a $6,000 house with four years of income. Mm -hmm. See? But to buy this home at today's prices, the average would be 10 years. 10 years. And that doesn't count um, the interest rate. See? That's no interest. Mm -hmm. So it takes two and a half times longer. In other words, this, the, the value, because of inflation, the value of the dollar is so much less than just, you know, a dollar versus $22.66. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, one thing that Alan was fond of pointing out to people, that the word mortgage came from the French word, the gauge of death. Mort is death. Mm -hmm. So you're gauging the death because it would take you basically your whole life to pay off that mortgage. <laughs> and then you never really own it because now you have to pay big property tax in order to own it. Mm-hmm. So you really don't own it, and you have to have insurance on it. Yep. And um, you never own it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You always have to pay property tax and insurance. And boy, aren't those property taxes just a... Uh, Ridiculous. Yeah. It's too much. Yeah. A person like me at my age, I have a horrible time trying to, I had to sell my furniture in order to pay my property tax. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> it is. It is. It's, um, you know, I mean, well, well, you can, I know we're sticking with the childhood, but um, you have a really nice home because your husband worked really hard. But unfortunately, he passed away 25 years ago, 26 mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah. And he left you in a pretty good situation at that time. Nobody knew you were going to live <laughs> to be this old. <laughs> That's right. If we'd have known how things were going to keep going up, such as our property tax and insurance. Yeah. We wouldn't have built such a big house. <laughs> well, I mean, you can you can chide yourself for building a big house, but the reality is that the taxes in relation to where it is mm -hmm. and what it is, and it's not like you live in a palace. No. The property taxes are way out of control. They way. are. They sure are. Where does all that money go? 
<laughs> that you pay property taxes. Our roads are just deplorable. Yep. I know. I know it. I, I mean, you know, they do... It's like... um. What do they call it? A shell game or the magician? You know, don't look in the sand or don't look in the or the the shell game where they're hiding something underneath those three mm-hmm. shells and they move them around because that's it's a magic trick. What happens to our our tax money? Because there is no evidence that they use it to maintain this town. There's the roads are you're, they're terrible. Mm-hmm. You could lose your car and never be seen <laughs> again in some of these potholes. <laughs> that's the truth. Um, but yeah, that that really just absolutely amazed me because again, like a, a salary, fifteen hundred dollars a year, the average salary in today's money would be thirty four thousand. Mm-hmm. So you think, okay, now you're talking about living a pretty decent life, even with your mother who was widowed and was always scrapping to supplement that insurance. Yeah. But you couldn't do that, you see, because at $34,000, when your home is only going to take you four years of work plus whatever the interest rate is, you know, at that time, you can't do that now in today's world because today's median income is... 44225 that would equal just under 2000 mm-hmm. in 1933 money but look at what you can get for that you know your home is today's money four times mm-hmm. what a home was then your car is four times what it was then so I made this note here that in 1933, the car was about one-third of a person's annual income, and now it's all their annual income mm-hmm. for one year uh, on the average price. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and forget about saving. I mean, when is the last time anybody was encouraged to save money? It's not worth it. You, you put your money in a bank, and we can see what's going on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. You can put your money in the bank, but it draws no interest. Yeah. And they do you, I mean, what was that thing that happened with your, you know, last few little pennies? They said, oh, we'll put it in this special account Mm -hmm. where you can't get to it for uh, 18 months. Yeah. But it it gets like... um, uh, half an interest <laughs> point something like that. I think my little money made about um, 13 cents <laughs> maybe 15 <laughs> well I hate to joke about the dire straits but at that rate you know you might not have to sell furniture to pay the property taxes next year if you're raking in 13 cents <laughs> I had several nice antiques that my mother-in-law <coughs> had given me and um, through the years, you know, and I had silver that we bought for our 25th anniversary and I had to sell that in order to pay my property taxes. Mm-hmm. It's just terrible. It is. It's terrible. Yeah. And You know, one of the the things, too, about that is that your property taxes have been fixed at a set place Mm -hmm. for how long? long, um, When I turned um, 65, they were supposed to be frozen. And most everybody's were frozen. But mine kept going up every year. I don't know why. I would go and protest it, and they would still go up. Yeah, I think that that, um, I've looked into that, I think that that so-called freezing it doesn't really freeze it at a, at a fixed place, mm-hmm. but it keeps it from going up at the same rate that everybody else's property taxes go up if you're under 65. 
But if you didn't have that, I mean, already I know what you pay in taxes, and you are not living in the Taj Mahal, and it's just a, it's criminal, it really is. But we're run by gangs at the top, don't you think? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Crooks. Yep. I mean, you've been watching the political system for a long time, mm-hmm. and, and uh, do you have any words of wisdom to shine on the, the, the crooks that run us? That Crooks that get every nickel you've got, they're going to get it. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't really seem to matter who's in the White House or who's the, you know, the, mm-hmm. the top dog in the game. They all are at it. Mm-hmm. They're all after it. Yeah. Taxes keep going up. Mm-hmm. Insurance keeps going up. Nothing you can do about it yeah. except pay it or get thrown out. Yeah. <laughs> Is that why there's so many homeless people? Well, the... <laughs> There are a lot of new homeless people, or I'd say newer homeless people. A lot of people got really hit hard Mm -hmm. by the financial crash of 2008. And I think what's going on right now with... See, it's all orchestrated. They know exactly what's happening at the top. And you notice how the politicians are always lining their pocket. They always seem to leave Washington with more money insider trading, all of that, than when they arrived there. I mean, can you imagine how much money Nancy Pelosi's got? Millions. Yeah. 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 So they, it's a, you know, for the politicians, Washington, D.C. is the ultimate get-rich-quick scheme. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is true. But anyway... I don't think that the solu- I've never thought that the solution for this was political because they all are gangsters, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a way, I mean that's that's why I'm curious about your memories of childhood when you were not um so dependent upon. I mean, yeah, you had to make money, but you're talking about the things that your mother had to pay for were not nearly as steep. Do you remember some of her expenses, some of the things that she'd talk about later on where the, where her money went? Well, you know, we had uh, electric, electricity bills and water bills and telephone bills. We always had a telephone. And some of our neighbors had to come and borrow our phone because they didn't have a phone. Mm -hmm. And you lived in a pretty good-sized town, but you were still able to keep chickens and cows and all of that within the city limits. Yeah, we did. We were in the city limit. And um, we had, uh, of course, we always had a garden and everything, like I said, and we we never went hungry. Mm -hmm. always had plenty to eat and drink and and our neighbors they had a the cooks was their name and they had honeybees and they had honey all the time they would um, give us honey and we gave them milk Mm mm-hmm one of the things that that I asked you about, you know, because I remember Mima being a, you know, a church going and just loved God woman. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, so who stepped in to help take care of her after your father died? Was it the church and the neighbors and everything? And you said... Yeah, it was. It was the church. Did They were always there to help her Mm -hmm. and to encourage her and uh, and the church and the neighbors they were always there Mm -hmm. for her and she was there for her neighbors too. yes uh uh-huh that was true see because oh go ahead that's all 
Okay. Well, see, one thing that I was thinking about was how you are and how you've been, because we we always say you're kind of like the rock of the family now, but you cared for your husband when he was ill and dying, and then one of my uncles came to live with you when he wasn't doing that well, and he actually spent the last 10 years of his life. And at, at my house. Mm-hmm. He lived with me, and I washed his clothes and cooked his breakfast every morning and, and supper every evening mm-hmm. for 10 or 12 years. Mm-hmm. And his own children, you know, helped helped out. Yeah, you know, they and they, did. they helped. They helped out financially, and they always looked after to make sure that he got to his doctor's appointments and stuff. But you were really the caretaker yeah. for those ten years. Uh huh. Yes, that's true. And I, I didn't mind it. I liked. I was glad that he got to stay with me. Mm-hmm. And. Um, I don't want to make you cry. (laughs) All right. So then um, in the last five years of my dad's life, my mom was gone, and I was in Canada, and my little brother was the primary caretaker in terms of just making sure that bills got paid and things like that got done. But once again... For those last five years, you he went to your house every afternoon and sat with you, mm-hmm. and you kept him entertained. And also, I need to say, too, that, that my father was suffering uh, dementia. So it wasn't just the pal. You just loved my dad. You know, you said mm-hmm. he had a great sense of humor, and you always worked with him over the years in mm-hmm. his businesses. But um, then he would come and sit with you in the afternoon and you would make the supper time meal for five years every day. Yeah, I did that. I didn't mind doing it. I enjoyed him coming and he would take a nap on the couch and then we'd watch TV together. Andy Griffin. (laughs) (laughs) We saw so many Andy Griffin shows. We had them memorized <laughs> <laughs> what they were going to say, and um, and I did cook uh, cook supper. We'd have supper at six o'clock. And the reason why I bring this up is because what what I'm curious about is if you <clears throat> feel because it seems to me that there is a difference in the way that people are nowadays. And I think we can even see this, like in our own families with the younger generations and so forth. But to you, it was there wasn't even a thought about it. You were going to take care of your brothers. Yes. And, and your mother always took care of people. And, and uh, Yeah, she always helped people. And if they needed a place to stay, she would let them stay in our house with us and for maybe a month or two until they could do better or get their own place or move on. And uh, so I, that's the way I feel, too. I feel like helping everybody that I can help. I think that's what we're supposed to do, is to help other people. But... Do you see a difference now with other people in the world the way that it was in your childhood that might have been more the norm? Yes, I do. I think it's different now than it was back when I was a little girl. It's a lot different. You want to talk about that a little bit? (laughs) Well. Just riff on that one, Betty. (laughs) I I don't know. They just... um, think more of their own self. They think more of their own livelihood and don't worry about other people. Mm -hmm. And I think we should help each other, help everybody we can. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, this is a 
an ugly old world <laughs> unless you are, you know, loving and kind to people that you that you meet. I don't know. I don't know what people are thinking about now. Well, it is interesting because, you know, we do see that with the even the younger people in our own family that there's, you know, they're lovely people. Yeah. But this sense of... See, because I, I think that that was what was going on when you were a child, mm -hmm. is family was kind of everything. Yeah. And you were going to move heaven and earth to help out your family, and you always kind of had a sensitivity. What did they need and where were they at? And that's kind of missing now. Everybody assumes that if you don't, aren't able to pay your bills, your property taxes or whatever, that there's some kind of a government agency that's going to help you. <laughs> and I don't want to get too deep into this, but, you know, we have looked into agency support to make your life a little bit more comfortable at your age. And I'm here to say publicly, it ain't there. Uh -oh. It's not there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... <laughs> I mean, I, I, I still remember, this was a few months ago, but do you remember, you know, somebody said, um, because you, your heater, mm -hmm. which is a, in this part of the world, it's the heater slash air conditioner, um, doesn't work. Uh, it's too it's old. It's too old. And it, it, it's like there's one in one half of the house, so you basically have to live in the half of the house that works, but in the other half, it doesn't work. And we found out, we had somebody come out and look at it. It was going to cost $9,000. And we mm -hmm. had a few different bids, and it was all about $9,000. <laughs> Between nine and $10,000. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like, well, if the family pitches in and we, you know, we put in this amount of money and everything, but we still couldn't figure out how that was going to work. So they said, oh, will you try this agency and that agency? And do you remember what that woman, I won't say the agency, but do you remember when we went to that agency, what that woman said to you about what you could do as a solution? I forgot. I forgot what she said. Well, good for you, because it was not nice. <laughs> she said, why don't you sell your home? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah she wanted me to sell my home. Uh-huh. And go live in a... A nursing home. Uh-huh. Yeah. And go live in a nursing home. And I, I, I just sat there and I said, well, Betty, Betty is 93 and she drives a car mm -hmm. and she takes herself grocery shopping and she gets up in the morning and gets dressed and puts on lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> And then she goes out, and that's after you've had your hot drink. Mm -hmm. you, it's not caffeinated. You just yeah. call it your hot, hot drink. Hot drink. And then you go out, and tell us what you do with the routine of taking care of your yard and the, all of that. So. Well, um, I do have a, a yard man that comes and mows on his $25,000 mower, <laughs> mowing machine, <laughs> and he has to get it paid for, so he's charging me a, a little over $100 every time he mows well. <laughs> in order to pay for his mower, his $25,000 mower. <laughs> Well, I will say this about your house and the property taxes. You are sitting in a nice piece of land. You mm -hmm. know? It's, uh, you've got more, much more yard than the average person in this area. So that's a good thing. But, but what do you do? That's, that's the, uh, the yard man. But you yourself are always out there picking something up, sweeping, picking raking. Picking up uh, little limbs and things that fall, you know, little limbs always falling out of the trees and <clears throat> I try to keep them picked up and um, pick up trash that blows up in my yard. And you sweep your back porch? I your... sweep my porches off, the front porch and the back porch. I keep them nice and clean. 
That is an understatement because I, when I went to pick you up this morning, I noticed, as I always do when I come to see you, that nice and clean doesn't cut it. They're like a surgical theater. <laughs> it makes me feel so sad when you come over to my house to eat lunch and there's just leaves and little limbs everywhere. And, you know, I go, oh, sorry, I'm busy. <laughs> Well, you're busy all the time, and I'm not, so I have to do something to keep busy. Well, it's um, what you do, too, though, is you take care of your things, and you take care of your home. Yeah. And, you know, what I wanted to say, too, is that you did all of this caring for your brother's and it turns out that I got home just in the nick of time because literally two weeks after I got here in 2021, you became very ill. Mm-hmm. I and, sure did. Yeah, and you had to have gallbladder surgery. Yeah, I did. I had gallbladder surgery. They put me to sleep. Twice. And took my gallbladder out. And then the next day, they didn't get a one of the stones and the next day they put me to sleep again. And that stone, it, was, it wasn't it was just floating around. It was blocking... It was blocking the bile duct. Yep. And they went down in my throat and with a, a light <laughs> and got that stone out. Mm-hmm. And I've been okay ever since then. Yeah. But it was it was just as well because then I got home and you didn't have to cook for dad every yeah. night and you could you know just take it a little bit easier mm-hmm. and and that's good. Although there is something to be said for purpose and you know having things that you have to do in the morning and get up yeah. for. Yeah. Well, I think everybody should try to do the best, you know, with what they have and take care of what they have and use it and and uh, be and try to be happy with what they have and don't be greedy. <laughs> <laughs> and don't be don't be greedy and selfish. Yeah. Well, those are good wise words to live by. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I what we're going to do is I'll make a little video thing to go with this. I have a few pictures of you, and I have a few pictures of um, Mima when the boys were going off to, to university. But it's sad, and you want to say what happened <clears throat> to the, the photographs of your early childhood and Mima when she was a young woman with the young children and everything, you can tell them what happened. Well, the lightning struck the house. Here where I live in my mom Uh and dad's house, and it burned. And it burned, and and, um, all the pictures got ruined, got burned up, or waterlogged. It didn't burn the whole house, but it burned the room Uh right underneath the roof where the lightning struck, and that was where all the family pictures Mm -hmm. Had them in boxes, Mm -hmm. and they all got burned. It was really sad. Yeah. So, and you know, but I will show people a few pictures of you when you were a little girl that I happen to have, and um, maybe we'll put some other stuff in there. You can tell me later on if you had a favorite song when you were a little girl in that time. A disket, a tasket, a brown and yellow basket. I send a letter to my mummy on the way I dropped it. I dropped it, I dropped it. Yes, on the way I dropped it. A little girly picked it up and put it in the pocket. She was trucking on down the avenue. But not a single thing to do She went back, back, backing all around When she spied it on the ground She took it, she took it My little yellow basket And if she doesn't bring it back I think that I will die 
Well, all of all of my four brothers graduated from university. Um, one with a doctor's degree, and all of them with master's degrees, and we all were um, got college education. <laughs> yeah, and that was that's pretty amazing. It is amazing for us. for not to have a. A father, you know, to yeah. support us. Yeah. Well, Mima was a good, strong little woman. She was yeah. a tiny woman with a big, huge heart. And she had a lot of faith, and she was really a, a good Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and she had faith, and she was strong. And, mm-hmm. yeah. She was very strong. Okay. Well, you, it, we we could be just about done, but I forgot about one other thing, and that was laundry day. Laundry day. Yeah, when did laundry day happened. Um, when I was a little girl. Yeah, that was like once a month. Or yeah, maybe? probably once a month. Because it was a big production. Mm-hmm. You want to talk about laundry day? Well, we had three wash tubs galvanized big round wash tubs and we had a wash pot where you built a fire under it and put water in it filled it up with water and it got to boiling and you washed all of your white clothes your sheets and towels in that boiling pot (laughs) (laughs) and you had a long um, broomstick that you got them out and put them in the first tub of of rinse water. You had three tubs uh-huh. of rinse water. Okay, so you took them out of the boiling water with uh-huh. a stick and well, then okay and carried them over to the to the rinse water, and they were washed again with a rub board. They were washed again with soap. And then they were put in the next tub, which was rinse. And then the third tub had bluing in it, bluing to to make them pretty and white. Then you hung them on the clothesline with clothespins, pinned them on the line, and they hung there until they dried in the sun. Wow. And then um, so on, the clothes that were overalls or khakis were washed in that wash pot Uh and then with a stick they carried them over to the rinse tub and then when it was all done and they were all hanging on the line then they would get dry then you had to go and take them in Uh and fold them and put them away (laughs) and um it's a huge, it's like a, it was a day, right? Yeah, it was all day. And then we children, we would get in those rinse tubs and <laughs> play, <laughs> play in the water. <laughs> okay, one more story. I'm going to make you tell one more story, and that is, okay, so you had chickens. You had plenty of eggs, mm-hmm. and then you had the chickens that you remember eating plenty of chicken meat. Yeah. But. Thanksgiving, that good old American tradition, Thanksgiving requires a turkey, Mm -hmm. and a turkey was a real treat, and I want you to tell the story of the year that Mima just did not have enough money for a turkey. She didn't have any money for a turkey, and um, she she, uh, knelt down and prayed, and she said, Father, what am I going to do? I need to have a turkey for my Thanksgiving dinner for my family. And she had just got up and walked outside, and there was a truck. A truck was filled with turkeys in the back of it. It was driving along the road going to market, and one of the turkeys flew out and walked right up to where she where she was standing and she reached down and got the turkey 
and cooked it. <laughs> and the truck kept going when the turkey flew off. It didn't even know, it didn't miss the turkey. <laughs> so she had a turkey dinner for Thanksgiving. Yeah. And that makes me think, see, you know, I'm just thinking about the difference between how we're raised. Right, we go to the store and everything's all neat and tidy. It's under plastic wrap. But mm -hmm. when Mima wanted to take one of her chickens and cook it, what did she do? Well, she cut the head off. Yeah. She went and grabbed it. Uh, and grabbed it. And, uh, and sometimes she would wring its neck mm -hmm. and twist, twist it around and around until the body would fall off and she'd have the head in her hand. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's a gruesome thing. But it is. Yeah. And then she would have to pick it uh -huh. and then dip it in hot boiling water to get all of the little feathers out. Uh -huh. And that that's what they did back then, yeah. you know, when they had chicken yeah. to cook. They had to do that. Yeah. So it was a production. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Betty... And she didn't have um, a hot water heater. Mm -hmm. All of the hot water had to be boiled on the stove. Well, that's how I lived in Canada. <laughs> it had to be boiling. <laughs> yep. You know, you yep. had to build a fire <laughs> uh -huh. in the stove and then boil your water. Wow. Well, Betty, thank you so much for letting me pick you up this morning and sharing all this with people. And I, I just. I'm happy to help you any way I can. Happy to help. That's sweet. I love that. Thank you. Because it was really helpful. I wanted to put something out on Thursday, and I, I certainly didn't want to do it by myself. I hate doing anything by myself. <laughs> I do too. I like to have somebody with me. So um, I thank you all for listening, and I think uh, next week we'll be back with the mystery guest that was not able to do today. <laughs> all right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. That was good, honey. I hope. <laughs> I got something that the world didn't